Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Civil Rights Before Brown, that is, before the Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board, 1954, that overturned the separate but equal doctrine. We usually look at two Supreme Court cases to note the beginning of the Jim Crow era, the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case that established the separate but equal doctrine, and the 1898 Williams v. Mississippi case that allowed poll taxes and other voting restrictions. Jim Crow laws existed before these cases, but the, these decisions told states that the Supreme Court would not stand in the way of discriminatory laws unless they specifically mentioned race. Often state and local governments passed them in response to perceived threats as well as in response to the level of active white supremacy in their jurisdiction. Montgomery, Alabama, for example, passed over the course of years Jim Crow ordinances that were bad, but Birmingham passed many more that were draconian even by the standards of the day. Birmingham became the focal point of the civil rights movement because it was known to be, quote, the most segregated city in America, unquote. This was a point of pride for local white supremacists who set off so much dynamite to terrorize union and civil rights activists that the city got its nickname Bombingham. This lecture discusses three topics. African American reactions to Jim Crow from about 1895 until the 1940s, the change of resistance from accepting segregation to realizing that separate was never equal, and that the only racial integration could provide equality, and six court cases between 1938 and 1950 that chipped away at the foundations of Jim Crow that began to fall with the 1954 Brown v. Board case. African Americans did not meekly acquiesce as Jim Crow rolled across the South. There was always resistance by individuals and small groups often on an ad hoc basis. But three African-American theorists offered meta-critiques of Jim Crow while simultaneously urging the community of black people to adopt their way of resistance. The first such theorist we'll discuss is Booker T. Washington. Born into slavery in Virginia in approximately 1856, he began attending school only at age nine then was able to attend Hampton Institute and Wayland Seminary. His own experience with difficult physical labor, he worked in a salt mine at one point, and the curriculum of Hampton led him to his philosophy of racial uplift through economic improvement and stability, leaving the fraught question of politics aside while showing white society that blacks could engage in the new Gilded Age quest for money, development of skills, and development of businesses to accumulate capital. Washington founded Tuskegee Institute in Macon County, Alabama in 1881, meeting first in a church, then engaging the students to build the campus from scratch on a purchased plantation. This was the core of Washington's philosophy. All students at Tuskegee did manual labor to supply their communal needs from farming to building on campus. In 1895, Washington was asked by organizers of the Atlanta Cotton Exposition to deliver the keynote address on Negro Day. He spelled out his philosophy and gained national attention with what came to be called the Atlanta Compromise. Washington spoke before a mostly white crowd telling them that blacks would eschew the populist political agitation that had flared in the 1890s and would focus on economic improvement of their race. In exchange, he asked whites to recognize the benefit of free and independent black race dedicated to vocational rather than higher education that challenged the status of whites, and that whites should protect blacks and support their education. If Washington's speech didn't pour oil on the turbulent waters at the local level, it certainly drew the attention of white philanthropists from the North and secured his place as spokesman for the race. Blacks didn't choose a spokesperson, whites assigned this role. In 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt 
had Washington dine at the White House, which set off a firestorm from both Democrats and the Lily White Republicans, which Roosevelt joined soon thereafter. In 1912, Washington formed an alliance with Sears and Roebuck President Julius Rosenwald to fund Tuskegee Institute and provide grants to black communities to erect schools. Another prominent African American, W.E.B. Du Bois, first supported Washington's Atlanta Compromise, then soon began to challenge it. Du Bois was born into a racially integrated community in Massachusetts, attended college in Nashville, where he first experienced Jim Crow, then Berlin, which was common among Northeasterners in those days, then was the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard in 1895. He accepted short-term appointments as an academic, then in 1897 began teaching at Atlanta University. His first book, The Philadelphia Negro, was a sociology of black life in that city and coined the phrase the submerged tenth to label the black underclass. In 1903, Du Bois coined the phrase the talented tenth as a label for an emerging black leadership that he thought should have the same elite education as the white leadership class. As early as 1900, he became interested in and promoted Pan-Africanism that drew together the extended community of blacks in Africa, the West Indies, and the U.S. in common struggle against ongoing oppression from slavery and colonialism, which he saw as two sides of the same coin. Furthermore, Du Bois advocated that the American black community should not accept debasement, but demand constitutionally supported political equality. All of this contravened Washington's compromise, and Du Bois began critiquing Washington's stance, first in a review of Washington's 1901 autobiography, Up From Slavery, then in an essay in his own book, The Souls of Black Folks, 1903. Although followers of both Washington and Du Bois made a good deal out of this difference, Du Bois said in an interview published in 1965 that he and Washington did not differ greatly and did not hold per personal animosity toward one another. Du Bois went on to found the Niagara Movement for Civil Rights in 1905 that folded into the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. He edited the NAACP's journal, The Crisis, from 1910 until 1934. The NAACP and the crisis were political. They agitated for a federal anti-lynching law, for example, and exposed white-on-black violence through public demonstrations. Du Bois joined the Communist Party in 1961 to protest U.S. laws and his earlier treatment in the Red Scare of the 1950s. His anti-colonialism led him to accept a job in Ghana at age 93, editing his long-desired Encyclopedia Africana under Ghanese governmental patronage. Because the U.S. had confiscated his passport in 1951, he claimed to become a citizen of Ghana, though he probably didn't actually do so. Du Bois died in Ghana in 1963. Our conversations move from what we might call the right wing of black resistance to Jim Crow through the center of resistance and will now take up what we might call the left wing. Marcus Garvey was a printer, journalist, and activist who was born in Jamaica in 1887. He traveled to Central America, lived in London for two years, then immigrated to the U.S. in 1917. His philosophy combined the economic uplift of Booker T. Washington with Pan-Africanism, which he expressed as first black economic self-sufficiency, then as full-on black separatism. In the 1920s, he even struck a cordial agreement with the Ku Klux Klan, believing that the outright racial exclusionism of the Klan made it possible for African Americans to carve out a rich life outside of what we might call the white gaze. Garvey believed that blacks should simply build a society and economy that had nothing to do with whites, so that blacks could provide for themselves, developing capacity and skills as they went along. To that end, he and others founded the United Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica in 1914, 
and created the first chapter outside Jamaica in Harlem in 1917. By 1919, the UNIA claimed two million members worldwide. UNIA had a plan of work that included many businesses, but the centerpiece was the Black Star Line of steamships that Garvey founded in 1919. This was a direct play on the name White Star Line. The Black Star Line owned four old ocean-worthy vessels used to transport goods at first, then passengers throughout the Pan-Africa world of the U.S., the West Indies, and Africa. But the age and conditions of the ships, as well as poor refurbishing and maintenance, led to constant problems, including having one sink and another blow its boiler, killing a crewman. As early as 1919, the Federal Bureau of Investigation under J. Edgar Hoover brought charges of mail fraud against Garvey and the other Black Star board members. The violation was that a ship not yet owned by the line was featured on its stock solicitation brochure. After the line went bankrupt in 1922, the board was indicted for ongoing mail fraud in trying to raise enough money to stay in business. Garvey was the only member convicted. He served five years in prison and was deported in 1927. Garvey's second wife, Amy Euphemia Jacques, led the UNIA after Garvey's deportation. Garvey himself remained active in supporting black artists and the anti-colonial movements in Africa. He maintained a hectic schedule, dying in London in 1940 at age 52. Rastafarians and the Moorish Science Temple of America considered Garvey to be a reincarnation of John the Baptist. During the Great Depression, it became obvious to many that separate was never going to be equal, and that the African American community could not develop sufficient capacity on its own, especially hobbled as it was, to improve life very much. Subtly, attitudes shifted toward the realization that at least some integration into the white community, the sole location of political and economic power, was the solution. This was not a community-wide decision, but we see the threads of a movement toward racial integration appear just before World War II. Eventually, that movement came to dominate the expanded civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Jim Crow affected African Americans in three overall areas, education, public accommodations, and voting. Jim Crow was an attempt to extend the racial caste system established under slavery by separating the black community from the white and by reducing the black community's capacity for economic improvement. As I said earlier, in addition to the three significant theorists of resistance uh, who we just encountered, everyday people resisted Jim Crow laws, often at the time of their invention. The Supreme Court's separate but equal formula articulated in the Plessy decision of 1896 was the linchpin for both educational facilities and public accommodations. But until after the Great Depression, the African American community did not have institutions that could programmatically take on the problems with Plessy. So individuals and communities resisted local and state laws and actions. We see this in the development of underground cotton markets when landlords refuse to allow their tenants to market their crops themselves. There develop thriving after dark markets for both cotton and personal goods, which many localities and states outlawed. Nevertheless, the markets persisted. Other blacks took economic matters into their own hands, supporting black businesses, refusing to support whites, or going on strike against employers who dealt unfairly. Most of these workers were not organized by unions, and such strikes and store boycotts were ad hoc affairs. But we see these tactics intensify during the Civil Rights Movement era. Some boycotts were community-wide. There were 25 streetcar boycotts from 1900 to 1905, as cities around the South implemented segregation ordinances or companies made such policies. During the 1930s, Primarily black farming communities organized into chapters of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union to campaign for fair treatment and as general protest organizations. 
Many were suppressed, as explained by Nate Shaw of Tallapoosa County, Alabama. As the local STFU organized, the sheriff raided meetings, which at one point led to a shootout. Shaw was wounded in the hip and waded a 16-mile-long creek all night to Tuskegee to receive first aid and to hide. People resisting alone was almost constant during the Jim Crow era. Studied incompetence and conforming to the worst stereotypes that whites held about blacks meant that many whites imposed themselves on blacks less than they might have otherwise. My lecture cannot begin to probe the complexities of how the African American community confronted Jim Crow, but I can draw some outlines for you. The black community saw that white accommodations would never be equal as long as they remain separate, so there developed a couple of strands of thought about how to press for equality through integration. One emerged from the protest tradition of both the black community and the anti-colonial movements, particularly that of Mahatma Gandhi of India. Gandhi believed that massive shows of nonviolent direct action that forced oppressive regimes to back down or get violent would shame them into relinquishing power. A racially mixed group in Chicago took up that route, forming the Congress for Racial Equality Corps in 1942. Theirs was a bottom-up approach to organizing, and they sought to find pressure points that would succumb to direct action. This was not sign-carrying protests, but presentation of their bodies in silent witness to what was right and wrong. Corps took an action in April 1947 that got them national attention, the journey of reconciliation. In 1946, the Supreme Court desegregated interstate buses in its Morgan v. Virginia case that we'll talk about more in a moment. Corps decided to test the South's conformity to that ruling with eight black and eight white men riding buses from Washington, D.C. through North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Whites would ride in the back and blacks would ride in the front unless they rode together. When their bus arrived in North Carolina, they were arrested and jailed. In one instance, two black members were arrested when two whites interfered they were also arrested. The black riders received 30-day sentences on the chain gang, while the whites, who were northern Jews, were given triple the time to teach them a lesson about consorting with blacks and telling southerners what to do. The other line of thought was to use the courts to enforce desegregation of public facilities. The NAACP had a legal department since its founding in 1909, but in 1940 upgraded that to the Legal Defense Fund under the leadership of attorney Thurgood Marshall. Marshall assembled a team were, who were as savvy as he was, and they began an aggressive campaign of suing for violations of rights. Marshall, in particular, was very leery of the kind of direct action proposed by Corps, thinking it would lead to serious violence. Marshall argued many of the most important cases of the era, including Brown. In 1967, President Lyndon Johnson appointed Marshall to the Supreme Court, the court's first African-American justice. Let's look now at six important Supreme Court cases that tore away at the underpinnings of Jim Crow prior to the Brown decision of 1954. Gaines versus Canada in 1938 was the first modern case to attack the foundation of Plessy and the separate but equal doctrine. It also shows that the NAACP didn't distinguish much between public accommodations and education, seeing them as of one piece. Lloyd Gaines applied to the University of Missouri Law School in 1935, which was reserved for whites, but he was rejected by Registrar S.W. Canada. Missouri had not provided for a law school at Black Lincoln University and offered to provide a scholarship for Gaines to study in another state. He declined and sued. The U.S. Supreme Court found that paying for black students to go out of state was insufficient, nor could a state provide professional education to only one group, even if demand from the second group was low. The university appealed 
but Gaines could not be found. The last time he was ever seen was at a fraternity house in Chicago, March 19, 1939. He went out to buy stamps and never returned. In 1948, the Supreme Court cited Gaines v. Canada when it ruled that an Oklahoma woman, Ada Sipule, must be admitted to the University of Oklahoma Law School. The court unanimously ruled in Sipule only four days after oral arguments by Thurgood Marshall. Dennis Lonnie Smith had been denied the right to vote in the Democratic primary in Houston. S.S. Allwright was the county election chief. One of the early 20th century strategies for disfranchising African Americans was for states to turn their authority to conduct elections over to private entities, in this case, the Texas Democratic Party, that then set rules not allowing blacks to participate. This worked because in the Solid South, the Democratic primary was tantamount to the election itself. The Supreme Court ruled in 1944 that this practice was illegal under the 14th Amendment. Once the state resumed operating the primary, it was unable to establish race-specific restrictions. So it used restrictions like the poll tax that kept both poor blacks and poor whites disfranchised in statistically significant numbers. In 1944, defense worker Irene Morgan refused to move to the back of an interstate Greyhound bus and suffered arrest in Virginia. Using Thurgood Marshall and William Hastie of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, she sued Virginia in the Supreme Court. Rather than make a 14th Amendment argument against the Virginia law, her lawyers argued that the Constitution's Commerce Clause meant that federal laws trump state laws when it came to interstate transportation. The Supreme Court agreed, though Virginia and other states simply ignored the ruling and continued to arrest such passengers. It was this case that sent Corps members on their 1947 journey of reconciliation. A similar case in 1960 Boynton versus Virginia, desegregated interstate bus terminals and set up the 1961 Freedom Rides. You might ask how a bus company could continue to segregate intrastate passengers but integrate interstate passengers or even tell this apart. Well, yeah, they couldn't. And it made segregationists crazy. Shelley versus Kramer is a case about housing. The Shelley family bought a home in 1945 in a St. Louis neighborhood that had a racially restrictive covenant in force since 1911. They were sued by a neighbor, Kramer, who, to vacate the house. The Supreme Court combined this with a case from Detroit and two from Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court overturned the Missouri State Supreme Court ruling that the covenant was an enforceable contract. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that while the covenant did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, enforcing it through state courts did violate the 14th Amendment. This stripped away the only real enforcement mechanism and signaled the demise of restrictive covenants. Interestingly, Three justices recused themselves because they owned property under racially restrictive covenants. But Jim Crow is wily, and zoning laws that were not racially specific but still harmed African Americans, as well as the so-called redlining practices by which banks refuse loans to blacks in certain residential areas, always a secret, replaced restrictive covenants. Another case, Sweet v. Painter, decided by the Supreme Court in 1950, is an important case on the road to Brown, for it highlighted the problems with the quality of being separate. Bill Sweet applied to the University of Texas Law School but was denied entrance. The state courts gave the University of Texas six months to create a black-only law school, and it did so in Houston. But that school, its faculty and its library were about one-ninth the size of the UT school, which Sweet thought inadequate. 
After appealing through Texas courts, Sweet and his NAACP lawyers, including Thurgood Marshall, sued in federal court. The Supreme Court ruled in 1950 that attempting to sidestep admitting an African American to a professional school by building a separate but unequal school was unconstitutional. Sweet attended UT Law for two years, but the long court case had made him ill. He dropped out in 1952, but graduated from Atlanta University with a master's in community organizations. After eight years in Cleveland with the NAACP and Urban League, he worked in Atlanta for the Urban League for 23 years. In 2005, Travis County, Texas renamed its courthouse after him. A companion to Sweet V. Painter is McLaurin versus Oklahoma State Regents, also decided on June 5th, 1950. George McLaurin, a retired professor of education with a master's degree from the University of Kansas, applied to the University of Oklahoma to pursue a doctorate in education. He successfully sued to gain admission. Then the university tried to conform to the Oklahoma state law that prohibited whites and blacks from being educated together by setting up separate facilities for McLaurin. These included a desk just outside of the classroom door and a separate table in the cafeteria. The U.S. Supreme Court required the university to cease segregating McLaurin. To summarize, African Americans did not merely accept Jim Crow, but resisted it as they could. Prior to the Great Depression, we can discern three schools of thought in the black community about how to deal with Jim Crow articulated by community leaders with a national presence. These schools of thought are linked to each leader's own experience. Booker T. Washington advocated what came to be called accommodationism. W.E.B. Du Bois advocated for political activism and education of the talented 10th. And Marcus Garvey advocated for black separatism and self-reliance. During the Great Depression and World War II, another line of thought arose that racial integration was the only way to achieve equality. Within that, two strategies appeared, nonviolent direct action and lawsuits. The Congress for Racial Equality chose the former, exemplified by its journey of reconciliation to test interstate bus desegregation in 1947. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People chose the second. Its legal defense fund, headed by Thurgood Marshall and similar lawyers in and out of the LDF, sued public entities to provide equal access and accommodations. We also reviewed six such lawsuits that address professional and graduate education, access to housing, access to public transportation, and access to the ballot. All of these tore at the foundations of the separate but equal doctrine established by Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, and all became precursors of the Brown v. Board case of 1954. This then ends the lecture, and as always, thanks for your attention.